In 1931, Sergei Rachmaninov composed his variations on a theme of Corelli. He was widely regarded as the leading pianist of his time, and one of the most gifted composers for the instrument. Nevertheless, he had published nothing for the piano in 16 years, and this was to be his last work for the instrument which he had played with such mastery from childhood, and which had sustained him in exile through long periods of silence as a composer. Although he called the work Variations on a Theme of Corelli, the melody in fact began life much earlier as a Portuguese folk dance known as La Folia. The theme had served as a basis for sets of variations by dozens of composers throughout the history of Western music. But in the process, it had become increasingly solemn, although never so much so as in the hands of Rachmaninoff. He was near the end of his life, and the melancholy which had never been far from his music is here almost unrelieved. And yet, the work is one of his finest, and not surprisingly, one of the most intimately revealing. It has held the particular affection of Vladimir Ashkenazi throughout his professional life. A Russian-born and Russian-trained musician whose performances of the work have had the ring as much of authenticity as of affection. And so we asked him to introduce the piece and then recorded a complete performance of it, which he gave at a public concert in Lugano. Rachmaninoff took it, of course, from Corelli. Uh, it's this tune, La Folia. It's not uh, a tune by Corelli, it is a traditional tune, as we know. Corelli simply quoted it. Rachmaninoff somehow stumbled upon it at some point and fell in love with it. Um, or maybe I should use a different expression, fell in love. It, it probably impressed him at that stage in his life. Um, very much, especially because a certain legend, uh, so it is said, uh, was attached to this tune, or is attached to this tune. Um, the legend goes like this, that there was a, a shepherd who was hopelessly in love, um, um, no reciprocity in his love, he was so uh, disconsolate that he decided to commit suicide and he threw himself off a rock and killed himself. So um, the melancholy and the tragic legend attached to it um, attracted Rachmaninoff very much, especially at that stage in his life when he felt especially sad, um, cut off from his country, which he missed very much. And this produced uh, a very impressive set of variations that has everything from hopelessness to gloom. I don't think there is a strain of hope in this piece. And even the only one lyrical passage, which is This lyrical passage suggests something touching, warm, uh, but I don't think it, there is a ray of hope there. I don't think it's generous. It's, it's intimate, closed lyricism that doesn't lead anywhere. It's like an island of warmth in, in the sea of gloom and darkness in this piece. You once said to me that you see a very striking distinction between the music that he wrote in Russia and what he wrote after he had left. It's true. Uh, with his early music, not very early music, but when he became a, a 
kind of full fledged composer with the second piano concerto, second symphony, third concerto, and so on. I basically find that um, although there is a lot of Russian sadness and nostalgia in his music, still he goes out very generously, giving out to everybody that he has. Like if, if, if his main topic, so to speak, is uh, the preoccupation with the, with the wonders and luxuriousness of life, and he wants to share his affection for life, his enjoyment of life. And uh, it's very touching, and I think it's very captivating. And that's why I think his music is alive. People respond to it, people want to enjoy life, most of them. Um, whereas his latest works, and the variations included, of course, um, signify, I think, withdrawal from life. It's like before he was opening up and now he was closing in. And it reflects even in his incredible harmonies. He was very inventive in harmony. He was a great pupil in harmony, actually. He had five plus always. Uh, it was a natural gift. Uh, whereas his um, early and middle works have always have harmonies that always opens and develops. But in Corelli, harmony closes in, like it becomes darker and darker. Like, uh, you know... Mm. It goes on. It's, it gets darker and darker, gets closed more and more. Uh, well, that's explainable by the state he was in, of course. He tried some happier music, to compose some happier music, like in his third symphony, the finale is supposed to be happy. Didn't work very well. It's probably one of his weakest compositions, because it was unnatural. He felt he had to compose a happy finale, because the finale is supposed to be happy. It didn't work. It's very interesting. Uh, what I wanted to say that uh, when we talked about the early and late music, <coughs> how open he was in the in his early and middle periods, uh, how he was giving everything away, and I think his melodic line and harmonies always um, went with this desire to give everything, and I think, for instance, you, it it like opens and gives everything out. To my mind, this is an... um, For me, it really signifies that he goes out, I don't know, on a hill or on a mountain and sees this view, beautiful view of life, and he gives everything to you, to, to the listener, to the world. Or even... And this is from the third piano concerto, and the first one, of course, was from the second. Again, it is opening all the time, opening and giving and giving and giving. Um, from the second symphony, for instance. Again, it's opening up, going up all the time. If you look to, uh, through his music of those periods, you'll see always rising, always giving away. Giving out, giving away. But you look in his late music, and it is in the Third Symphony, for instance. one of the central tunes in the second movement of the third symphony, or the first movement of the third symphony again. Again, it's a central tune. Uh, symphonic dances, again, the same. So 
So it's never giving out anymore. It's closing in. It's going down. It never goes up anymore. It's very interesting. It, I don't know if it's a superficial observation. To me, it's not. I think it's a natural move of the composer. He couldn't bring himself anymore to give out. How Russian is his music to Russians? Well, I think um, essentially Russian, uh, substantially Russian. It can't be more Russian. Uh, Rachmaninoff's music is probably, probably he was one of the most Russian composers. He was very modest, as far as I can make out, both about his achievements and his aims. Yes, he always said that he wrote his music just uh, in hope that it'll give pleasure to others. And he never put himself into the ranks of the greatest composers. Um, I think it is a sign of modesty. Uh, but uh, his music still lives. It's not that uh, things live sometimes for the right reasons, but I think his music is with us for the right reasons. I think it has a lot to say. Uh, what makes music worthwhile for me is the attempt by the composer to express something essential in our lives. And there is no doubt in my mind that Rachmaninoff would his person, his commitment to his art, to everything that I know about his life. He, his aim in life was to express something essential, something elemental, something so important to our lives. Um, and his, as I already explained, his strongest point are, points are generosity of expression, um, enjoyment of life, giving it away, and then at the same time, uh, fear of death, and fear of gloom, fear of darkness, and so on. If these elements are not essential to our lives, then I don't know what is. And I think he expressed this with idiomatic eloquence. I'm not saying that Rachmaninoff was one of the greatest, greatest composers in the world. That's not the point. He didn't possess the economy of means, of course. Perhaps he could have said the same with fewer words, with fewer notes. But that is less important than his attempt to say something important. And I believe that his music will be alive for a very long time, or maybe forever, because of this attempt.